guys, right guys? There we go. Thank you. Hi, well. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to our Happy New Year show. New Year's Eve 2021. Uh, back, just wrapped up episode 250, if you can imagine, of uh, Waxing On. Uh, we're heading into 2022, and of course, as has been our custom last year, and again today, we're going to take a look back at our top videos for the year. Now, one of the things I've noticed, and if you watch the show, you probably got this as well, is we have a very diverse program. Um, 250 episodes. Basically, we haven't repeated an artist. Now, a number of those artists have multiple albums out, but we've done 250 um, pretty much different artists over the last, uh, well, since May of 2020. But this year, we've got uh, some surprises. We usually cover jazz and big band on Mondays. We do uh, classic rock Tuesdays. Friday can be anything from country to folk to classical music to comedy. Just about anything. Soundtracks, Broadway, a lot of different kinds of music. And when you figure out the albums we've covered, the number of artists we've covered, and the number of records and songs they've produced, this is something that's going to blow your mind. Uh, it's all done with 12 notes. The same 12 notes can go from inspiring people and getting them all pumped up with some great rock and roll to relaxing them and soothing them with some nice mellow tones to uh, celebrating like our Irish movies with uh, Van Morrison. Um, it's hard to believe. It's like 12 words in your vocabulary and we can do so many things with it. And over the course of the last year, we've seen some very interesting groups and very diverse groups. What I'm going to do is we'll just take a look at firstly our top 10 and a lot of different things popped up during that time. Now, just before I get into them, I want to thank everybody that's been watching. We're getting quite a few views every month. Um, when I look at my demographics of the, uh, the audience, it's surprising I'm working out of Canada and I only have at best maybe 25% Canadian viewers. Sometimes it's less than that. So we've got viewers from all across the world watching. And again, if any of you want to comment, just to let me know where you're coming from, it's been great to see some of them. I had some people from uh, Japan commenting on one of the videos the other day. And while we're doing this at New Year's, some of you may be already in the celebrations as, you know, we're not going to get to it till 1130, 12 o'clock tonight. You may be already celebrating New Year's by the time you watch this. So. Again, it's around the world. It's hard to know what everybody's interested in. Sometimes the jazz ones do really well. Other times it might be rock and roll. It might be just a specific album. And if you check out the YouTube site, you'll see we do have things broken down into playlists. So if classic rock's your thing, you can go in and check out all the ones that uh, were classic rock. I know because uh, it, it's such a diverse uh, palette we're working with, not everything may appeal to everybody, but we try to categorize it so that the things you do like, you can find them all in one area to take a look at. Okay, let's take a look. Number 10. Now, surprisingly, we had some ties this year. Uh, we had a couple of albums tied in at number 10. And again, who could be more diverse than this? Gary Newman. Pleasure Principle was one of the albums we looked at. Replicas. Uh, the only two I had purchased. Uh, kind of techno pop. Very different. Uh, biggest hit, I think, was the song Cars. And, again, Gary Newman, very diverse from the one he tied with. Who could be more different than that techno pop than the Rat Pack? Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, we did a compilation album with them, and they were right up there tied with Gary Newman. One of the ten top videos we uh, produced this year in uh, 2021. It just goes to speak to the diversity of the whole program and just how much music we can get out of those same 12 notes. Uh, number nine. This was a fun one. It was uh, episode two or 153, Greatest TV Theme Songs, a TV Guide album. Uh, I think it was the 50, 50 all-time favorite TV themes. Lots of uh, different ones, lots of great memories from the tunes. And I'll tell you, there's some excellent studio musicians playing on here. Uh, we've got 
well, I can't name all of them. Uh, I know that a lot of them with the, uh, I guess, studio background and trumpet players. There's some great stuff with Y five O. There's uh, Jetsons. We've got uh, there's lots of great stuff out there. Um, Keith Jarrett came in. The next one, uh, we looked at his Treasure Island album, but we also talked about the Colon concert, the one he came out and totally improvised. Uh, with a, a makeshift piano that was never really tuned right, you know, and how he was able to turn that into just such an excellent concert. Uh, the Treasure Island, some great people like Charlie uh, Hayden playing along with him, and we talked about Charlie Hayden a little uh, later in another episode where we featured what he was doing. But Keith Jarrett, just an excellent piano player, had uh, started out again with Miles Davis. There were so many great players came out of his band in the fusion years in the 1970s, and Keith Jarrett was one of them. Now, tied with Keith Jarrett for, uh, what are we at now, 10, 9, 8th place, was one that really surprised me. Uh, a couple of musicians, country, comedy, they were studio musicians, they produced jazz albums. Like, just what they did was so, uh, so mixed. I mean, who would expect jazz from Homer and Jethro? A great comedy team uh, who made their... Um, history by playing parodies of popular songs. And that was a, kind of their routine. And they produced a lot of albums. Uh, like I say, they really jumped into the mix here because so different from what we had with Jazz and the Rat Pack and Gary Newman, all of a sudden this uh, down-home country bumpkins doing a Homer and Jethro routine was right up there in the pile. And also tied with that, again, something totally different, Carole King and their Tapestry album. I mean, Carole King had been known as a singer-songwriter, produced a lot of great hits. Tapestry was probably her breakthrough album and one that's still selling well and one that is just uh, the epitome of what Carole King was doing. So many great hits on there. If you listen to it, you probably know them all and can sing them by heart. Okay, the next one in line. So we've gone, what, 10, 9, 8. We're down to number 7 with 1983 album by Cyndi Lauper. She's So Unusual was the one I featured. Uh, we had another couple of uh, cassettes in there. But Cindy Lauper came out at a time, uh, same as Madonna, but I kind of found Cindy Lauper's music was a little more accessible for me. But she was a character. She was doing music videos that were fun. She had uh, Captain Lou Albano, uh, the wrestling manager, in her music videos. Uh, she was involved in the first WrestleMania as a manager of a uh, wrestler, Wendy Richter. I mean, she was doing things. She did We Are the World. Uh, the big hit with uh, Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones. She had a good part in that. She really stood out as somebody special, a little quirky, bit of a character, lots of fun. Okay, next in line was John Lennon. Uh, we featured an album, this was episode 158, that really wasn't John Lennon's songs. I mean, after he split with the Beatles, he was doing a lot of work. He had his solo work. He worked with Plastic Ono Band. Probably one of his bigger albums was Imagine, and his final album, Double Fantasy. But it was an album where he recorded a lot of old rock and roll songs that we uh, looked at. And it was just simply called John Lennon Rock and Roll. And kind of a throwback to a simpler time and to see him do music that was not Beatles oriented, but uh, his take on some old rock and roll tunes from the 50s and early 60s. Okay, next in line, episode 116. Canadian band from out west, the Guess Who? Randy Bachman, Burton Cummings. Some great hits. American Woman, Share the Land, uh, No Sugar Tonight. Lots of great tunes in there. We featured the Greatest Hits album because, again, I didn't have a lot of uh, Guess Who music. But it was basically tunes I had grown up with. And, again, when we watch the program, you notice a lot of times I'll promote live albums or best of. If you're new getting into a band, best of is a great place to start because it gives you a good cross-section of what they really had success with. After the Guess Who, we had another Canadian band, this one from Toronto, Skip Kroprof and Bob McBride, and it was Lighthouse. And one of the breakout players from Lighthouse was Howard Shore, sax man who you may remember was musical director on Saturday Night Live when it first got started. And Howard Shore's gone on to do great work in uh, soundtracks. I think in Lord of the Rings, one of the first ones to come to mind that he had done. But uh, Lighthouse had a lot of great hits. We featured the One Fine Morning album. 
And certainly it's doing very well. I mean, Lighthouse right now, one, two, three, in top four. So again, another Canadian band that really broke out and a lot of people got behind it. And to wrap up our Canadian trilogy, it was episode 141 in the number three spot was Gordon Lightfoot, folk singer from Sarnia and living in Toronto. And we featured a couple of his albums from the mid-70s that I thought were some of the best Gordon Lightfoot had done. Uh, Summertime Dream and Endless Wire. And if you go back to the episode, it was 141 was Gordon Lightfoot, but I did another episode after that, kind of an add-on to it, because I'd received a, a comment from a fellow from Toronto who had a story to tell about this, and it was really amazing. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the song Record of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It was on the Summertime Dream album, but... It was, according to him, it was recorded in the first take, that was it. They sat down to play it first time in the studio, nailed it, and kept it. And I mean, this is pretty much unheard of in the music business. But just a classic rendition, a great song by Gordon. And again, a lot of material, all Gordon Lightfoot. I mean, he writes his own, performing. He's still out there going in his 80s right now and doing concerts and doing tours. Okay, number two was a surprise. Uh, episode 194. Um, sometime, I think it was last fall, the end of the summer, I had a friend drop off a bag of albums she'd picked up at, I think it was a second-hand store. And in that bag was an album by a band called The Seekers. And it was titled Georgia Girl. Now, yeah, I knew Georgia Girl. I knew the song. When I listened to the album, there was a few other songs I recognized on there. I'm just going to go over. I got some of it on the sheet here because, again, I wasn't that familiar with this band. Um... I called them folk rock, but it was really hard to categorize what they were doing. It wasn't like folk rock that I think of when I think of the birds. This was very different. It was kind of pop folk, uh, very accessible, some great tunes. A um, couple songs here, Georgia Girl, uh, Morning Town Ride, I'll Never Find Another You, Red Rubber Ball, and you may remember that one was also a big hit for a band called Circle. And... Uh, also, some of their songs, they were co-written with another great folk singer, Paul Simon. So they had some connection in, the, in the North America as well. But, I mean, this album really took off. It was, within a few weeks, it was our number two or number three contender for the number of uh, views and uh, a new release on our videos. People really got behind the Seekers. And Seekers made up of uh, Keith Potker, Anthal Guy, Bruce Woodley, and the incredible Judith Durham. Uh, vocals, that was just excellent what she did. You can find some of their stuff on uh, YouTube as well. There's some great videos of the band. And it's just feel-good music, but very hard for me to describe. It was hard for me to pigeonhole where we were going to put that in the show. But again, a lot of people got behind it and made it the number two watch video of uh, 2021. Okay, and the last one. Number one uh, person who I... I thought nobody's going to know who this is, but I'm going to do it anyways because I like the subject matter. And it was a jazz musician, sax player called John Zorn. And he put an album out called Spillane. Now, even on the cover, um, I mean, it looks like Mickey Spillane. When I read Mickey's books, and he wrote all the Mike Hammer books, I can't help but picture him as Mike Hammer. I know in the movies there was a lot of other people depicting him. Stacy Keach had... Uh, Mike Hammer is his main character for uh, the TV series. There were a couple of movies. I think one called The Girl Hunters where uh, Mickey Splane actually played Mike Hammer. And to me, that was the, the true character. So when you see this picture, that's who it really reminds me of. And I think that's what he's trying to depict. But it's based on books by mystery writer Mickey Splane. Now, he had a great run. I mean, he sold millions and millions of books. Just an excellent writer. I enjoy his material. I read it quite often. I'm still rereading a lot of his books that I read a few years ago. And it's not just because of the story. It's the way he writes. Um, I'll tell you, I enjoy every paragraph. I enjoy every sentence that he puts down there, just the way he writes the, the books. And John Zorn is trying to depict some of that in this album. Now, the album had three different sections. One was uh, involving a string quartet. Uh, then we had another section where Albert Collins is featured. And in the first section, he's got a jazz band playing the story of Spillane with a narration going along with it. Now, most times if you're a musician, you're used to looking at music on the page. Um, piano player, you've got a number of different staves you're looking at. Uh, other players, you'd see all those notes. Everybody blends in together. John Zorn did something quite differently. 
I'll just read you what it says here. Uh, the album is named after mystery writer Mickey Spillane, whose novels featuring detective Mike Hammer proved the basis for the album's title track. Zorn wrote Spillane on a series of index cards, each containing an outline or instruction for the musicians that was intended to invoke scenes from one of Spillane's novels. One card states, scene of the crime, number one, high harp harmonics, basses, trombone drone, a guitar, sounds of water dripping, narration on top. That's what they had. No music, no notes, no time signatures, no sharps, no flats. We want something to sound like the scene of the crime. Play what you think that fits like. You know, here's what we want. We want the harp, we want the basses and trombones, we want guitar doing something. Just figure it out and do what fits for you, you know. Can you imagine getting that as instruction as a musician? And luckily he had people that had the talent to pull this off because that kind of direction I mean you can create some amazing stuff that way just everybody get that feeling and say okay that's what that feels like to me I'll play what I think that is and it worked uh, musicians were not given traditional sheet music but just a series of cues and outlines that's just amazing it's a great album to hear just from that standpoint alone of how he was able to put uh, a whole concept together with just cue cards and outlines and hints of what he wanted people to do so that's it 2021 number one album john zorn spillane if you haven't heard of it uh take a look around i know it's on youtube i went on some of the streaming networks and no i can't find it you can buy hard copies i know uh, amazon still has some but if you get a chance to listen to it it's just amazing to hear how this experiment works out Again, I'd like to thank everybody for stopping by. It's been great having you with us for the last 250 episodes. We've got lots more to come. I'm hoping you'll stay with us into 2022. We'll see where that takes us. Uh, we originally started this program back in May of, again, 2000. Gosh, that was 2020. The pandemic had started in March. I was looking for something to do, you know, to go through my albums and maybe share some ideas of albums that I had and you might be interested in checking out. Who would have thought... 2022 we'd still be in the same boat we're still in isolation here at home not getting out hardly at all this is really my main connection with the outside world and it's uh, kind of sad in one way and kind of great in another way so if you do have comments if you've got any thoughts if there's certain albums you like or you'd like to have more information about hey make a comment that's great don't be afraid to like don't be afraid to share the more we can get this out the more fun we're going to have with it so hopefully we've got quite a few more episodes to go, not because of the pandemic, right? We want to be out of that as soon as we can, but we may still keep this going after that. That was just kind of the, the thing that ignited the idea and got us going into doing this in the first place. So everybody, 2022, everybody have a great New Year's. Take care. Stay safe. We'll see you, uh, I guess Monday we're back with a new episode. Thanks for stopping by. Okay, guys, shut up. Here you go. Get your head in.